experts, uh, distinguished guests. I, I don't know how distinguished I'm going to be, but um, I'll try to um, keep your brains appetized for the next 10 minutes or so until I join uh, the rest of uh, the distinguished panel uh, to discuss the, uh, the situation on campuses more seriously. Okay, so I want to thank obviously the, the students, the faculty, the staff, the administration of FIU, any who's in the room, uh, along with the residents of South Florida, who all came here tonight to discuss a very important problem that less than a decade ago, we might not have believed would have existed in the context that it does today. The crux of the problem of anti-Israel activity on college campuses across the country today is that it eerily mimics the tactics that Israel's enemies and detractors around the world have unfortunately successfully used in recent years to hijack the debate on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Their aim, their goal, is to fundamentally change the discourse of Israel on college campuses from a rational discussion of the core issues of the conflict based on actual realities on the ground to a hyper-simplified, irrational analysis of the conflict rooted deeply in anti-Israel activism based on what Natan Sharansky coined the three Ds, double standards, demonization, and delegitimization. So let's talk for a moment about the three Ds. Using slogans such as, stop Israeli apartheid, Israel's detractors on campus use double standards to directly compare Israeli treatment of the Palestinians as no less than what took place under apartheid South Africa. They do this, keep in mind, while simultaneously remaining silent on real human rights abuses caused by brutal, dictatorial regimes against their own citizens, such as, for example, the current suppression of the uprising in Syria, which has seen Assad kill more than 7,000 of his own Syrian people. Or how about in Saudi Arabia, where some offenses in that country somehow rise to the level of public beheadings? And what about North Korea, where acquisition of nuclear weapons clearly was more important to Kim Jong-il and now his son than feeding its own citizenry? In some cases, anti-Israel activists enhanced their point on campus by creating mock separation barriers in university quads for uninformed students to walk through as they are headed to class. They then hound these students with misconstrued facts and figures without providing context in order to show the racist Israeli state, rather than one that is trying to merely survive in a region where many people simply don't want them there. When campus protests are organized, every time an Israeli defensive action is taken, such as Operation Cast Lead against Hamas in 2009, or the flotilla incident we remember from 2010, what are they really saying? Are they saying, Israel, please be more careful, please be more cautious in the defense of your country? No, of course they're not doing this. They're using wordage such as illegal Israeli actions or criminal Israeli policies to try and justify why Israel should not take any actions to protect its own country and its own citizens. So I ask these activists, why do we not see these same protesters coming out against military operations of other countries that they take to protect their own citizens? When we see anti-Israel protesters holding up signs which show the swastika equated with the Star of David, or the swastika even replacing the Star of David on the Israeli flag, or the phrase, Holocaust by Holocaust deniers, what are Israel's detractors really trying to say? That Israel's actions are simply no better than the Nazi regime, who systematically murdered millions of people, including six million Jews. This demonization of the state of Israel aims to show the state as inherently evil by taking the worst offenders in human history, the Nazis, and trying to change the discourse to show that Israel is the same. This, of course, not only belittles the memory of those that were massacred under the Nazi regime, but it ruthlessly and wrongly paints a picture of the bloodthirsty Israeli. Using posters saying, say no to Zionism, say yes to Palestine, Israel's detractors are using the tactic of delegitimization 
stating that Palestinians have the right to self-determination, but Jews do not. After all, the simplest definition of Zionism is simply the right of the Jewish people to determine their own destiny in their own historic homeland. So what are Israel's detractors really saying here when they say no to Zionism? What are they really saying no to? Well, the answer is very clear. They're saying no to the state of Israel. Students for Justice in Palestine was created for the sole purpose of damaging Israel's reputation amongst America's young people on college campuses. They were not created in any way to build bridges between Muslim or Arab students and Jewish students on campus. They were not created in the interest of honest dialogue on the Arab-Israeli conflict, which I'm sure most, if not all, Jewish students on college campuses would have welcomed with open arms. Their only reason for existence is to stoke anti-Israel sentiment on campus through the utilization of the three Ds I already mentioned. Well, the first SJP group was created at UC Berkeley in 2001, and in just 10 short years, more than 75 chapters of this group exist across our country, including four of the five largest university campuses in the state of Florida. They facilitate and they run Israel Apartheid Week each year dedicating all five days in any given week that they choose to calling out Israel in every which way possible. Sadly, we saw Israel Apartheid Week for the first time come to the state of Florida last year, right here at FIU. And to commemorate just how much progress Students for Justice in Palestine has made nationally, they gathered last year, in October, for their first national conference, hosted by Columbia University. And who was one of the main organizers of this first historic national conference? One of SJP's most involved leaders right here at Florida International University. But as bad as everything that I mentioned, as bad as all of this is, as scary as the rhetoric is becoming, by far the most damaging movement emerging on college campuses nationwide is the menacing boycott, divestment, sanctions movement that Shlomi earlier referred to, commonly known as BDS. The goal of this relatively new movement is to advocate the boycotting of all things Israeli, including goods, products, and even intellectual capital, in the hopes of pressuring the state of Israel to acquiesce to their demands, whatever those demands might be. The scary part is that the methodology of this movement, which uses common words and phrases that all human rights loving people would believe in and get behind, Yet the organizers have a greater, sinister goal underlying all of this, and that is the three Ds. Stand With Us last year came out with a creative antidote to the lies and deceit of BDS. They created, actually, a comic book, an online comic book, not unlike Superman or Spider-Man, and they called it Captain Israel. And their most recent edition of this comic book shows Captain Israel fighting the venomous BDS snake, which essentially, that's what it is. It's a snake. Well, the University of Pennsylvania, one of our top Ivy League schools in our country, they just hosted a three-day conference, a three-day BDS conference last week, which was attended by more than 300 people and had over 50 featured speakers, many of which ADL has backgrounders on. If you visit our website, you can take a look at them. Many of these speakers have a long and documented record of virulent anti-Israel rhetoric, including expressions of, and support for terrorist groups that violently attack Israeli civilians, comparisons between Israel and Nazi Germany, and making blanket statements about Israelis in general that borderline anti-Semitism. And of course, Florida's college campuses are not immune to BDS action either. Many BDS uh, events in Florida are organized, at least in part, by some SJP chapters, most notably last year with a boycott of Ahava Dead Sea products at Bed Bath & Beyond in Aventura, and a flash mob that took place at a Gainesville Publix protesting the sale of Sabra and Tribe Hummus. So what I just laid out for you in the last 10 minutes or so is a, it's a snapshot of the methodology and ideology used to delegitimize Israel on campus. But I would be remiss if I had not put all of that into perspective, into context. There's a very clear light at the end of the tunnel from what I just mentioned. Today, more than ever before, Jewish students have the tools, resources, and assistance to strongly and openly support Israel on campus. 
Before 1998, think about that. Birthright Israel never existed. Hillel's today are serving more college campuses nationwide than ever before. Every year, Jewish organizations are dedicating more and more of their precious resources to pro-Israel advocacy. And as a testament to this, in just two weeks, there's a two-day summit on the campus of Florida Atlantic University dedicated to provide the community with a better understanding of the complexities Israel faces every day. Look, I've already mentioned that more than 75 SJP chapters exist on college campuses across this country with a single goal of calling out the state of Israel. And for the most part, at those schools, Jewish students have those tools available to them to fight against the lies and fight their anti-Israel activism. And I didn't even mention, by the way, that there are literally thousands of college campuses in our country with absolutely no SJP chapters at all and absolutely no anti-Israel presence at all. So with the help of organizations like the ones that have co-sponsored tonight's very important event, Jewish college students have the ability and the opportunity, like never before, to effectively fight the anti-Israel lies and promote the numerous positive qualities that the state of Israel has to offer. And to that end, you're going to now hear uh, from Rebecca Sterling. I'll call um, Rebecca up. She is a bright, passionate, young, energetic Jewish student leader here at FIU. And she has taken the lead to be able to think of creative solutions to help mitigate the damage anti-Israel activists have attempted but failed to levy on this very campus here at FIU. Thank you. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank FIU, SIPA, and Middle East Society for giving the opportunity to illustrate to you what, what it's like to be a pro-Israel student on campus and to lead that movement um, at FIU specifically. Um, I am the president of Shalom FIU, which is the first pro-Israel organization on campus run by students. Um, the the mission of Shalom, FIU, of Shalom FIU is to educate students about Israel and about the Middle East, to paint a, a uh, wider and more complete picture of the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict, um, and also to demonstrate support for the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, we support Israel as, the, as an ally, the strongest ally of the U.S. in, in that region, um, and also as a democracy and a beacon of human rights in that region. Shalom FIU is open to all students, regardless of, of race or religion or, or gender. Um, so any student is welcome to join our group if they want to be part of this important movement. Um, the relationship we have with uh, students on, camp on campus is uh, basically we invite students to um, attend our meetings and events so that they can later on become leaders um, and know how to properly you know, uh, advocate for Israel on our campus and, and off campus as well, and how to become an active participant in the pro-Israel movement um, even after uh, they finish their college uh, years. So um, we've been uh, very lucky to have uh, the support of the FIU community. Um, and have co-sponsored events in the past. And basically I want to give you an idea of the origins of the student group on campus and how, uh, how we started off. So Shalom FIU began with uh, a few, uh, t about two, two and a half years ago. Um, it was founded by a student, Andrea Valenzuela, who she's, um, she was studying uh, politics at FIU and later became an economics major. Andrea Valenzuela is not uh, even Jewish, but she, she was very much interested in Israel and in the Middle East in general, and she understood that it was very important for, um, for youth to become more involved and educated on this issue. So um, later on, uh, she helped me with the transition to leadership as president of Shalom FIU, by introducing me to, um, to community members and leaders um, of different organizations and allowing me to increase my knowledge on Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship. Um, 
the reason why I became involved in the first place was I grew up in a in a Jewish household, and you could say a Zionist household. Um, I after high school I went to Israel on the Yom Judea program. Um, I spent a year there. I was volunteering and I was learning there, um, so I got to know the Israeli people very well. And later on, when I returned uh, to the States and I began uh, my career as a university student, I was very shocked to find that there were students on campus who were promoting um, anti-Zionist and anti-Israel um, events and to the general uh, like student body. And I didn't see that there were any Jewish students um, or students in general who were concerned with that this was happening on their campus. And I really wanted to find out why that was. And when I looked uh, on a, more introspectively, I realized that, well, do I even know how to defend Israel? I mean, I was there, I can talk about what I've seen, but in reality, if, some, if I had gotten into a conversation, I wouldn't know how to respond. So it was after my first semester on campus that I experienced what was then termed Palestinian Awareness Week, um, and it was started by SJP, um, that I recognized the need for me to, uh, to actually know what I'm talking about and, and go through with some training um, and about Israel advocacy, how to effectively communicate for Israel. Um, so that's when I became involved with Hasbara Fellowships. I went on their Israel program, and I spent two weeks in Israel um, looking very much in depth into Israeli society as a diverse country and a democracy um, and, and truly a beacon of human rights in that region and around the world. Um, so I was able to return to campus with that knowledge and the ability to communicate um, for Israel. And I was very lucky to have Andrea Valenzuela, who was there, who introduced me to organizations like APAC and also put me in touch with the ADL. Um, and, and from there on, build a student group on campus. Um, we, because we're open to everyone, you know, we wanted especially to allow the student leaders on campus to understand the complexities of Israel um, and to see Israel as more than just a place of conflict, but rather to understand the, the, the source of, of the U.S.-Israel relationship and why students on campus support Israel. Um, so within about one semester, we were able to have the support of, of many students um, especially those in, in student government here at FIU, and we invited them to attend uh, an APAC event. It was the APAC National Summit, um, and this was really the, the first time that we understood that the, it really had become uh, a little out of hand um, regarding the opposition to the students even attending this event. Um, they had been invited by myself, by, with, by Andrea, and by APAC to attend this event separate from any involvement as uh, student government in FIU. And, and, uh, and then students began to lobby the stu uh, FIU students who were opposed to this, uh, students from, from Students for Justice for Palestine, um, lobbied our student government, and essentially what they did was they, they pressured them and intimidated them so that while most actually decided to attend the conference because they were it was an <coughs> educational um, forum for, for something that was very relevant today as, you know, as Americans, um, they, a, a couple of them actually didn't attend the conference and they were intimidated to not attend that conference. Um, it was, what was more troublesome was that, um, for example, we had, there was an article published in our student paper about um, comparing APAC, well, no, not comparing, 
uh, labeling APAC as a terrorist organization for supporting Israel. Um, and that was a really big sign that, that well, we can't just allow these, these slanders, this libel to, to be present in our campus media without a, a refute. And that's when students began to recognize and, and students who were already, who were pro-Israel began to recognize that, you know, it was time for them to step up and for them to actively participate. Um, but, of course, the goal of Shalom If I You is not to, is not to, to criticize um, other students because people are entitled to their own opinions and people are entitled to free speech. Um, so, basically, what we want to get, get across and the message we want people to understand is that is that Israel wants peace. Israelis want peace. Um, and so that's when we decided to do an Israel Peace Week on our campus. Um, that was, it turned out that it, it happened to be at the same time as Israeli Apartheid Week, but we, we kept our events separate and you know we kept our message peaceful and, and non-controversial and just, and just um, getting across, you know, facts and information about Israel as a country that that wants peace and has made great efforts to tr to try to make peace with the Palestinian people and with its neighbors. So um, all of this was only possible with help from organizations um, that from you know the FIU, SIPA department, um, especially the Middle East Society, um, who provided students with broader knowledge on the region. Um, the Judaic Studies Department, for example, um, the JCRC and, and uh, ZOA has our fellowships, and, and the ADL were also um, helpful um, and under, in understanding that this needed to happen. Um, but we still face some challenges on campus. Um, some people say that the greatest challenge we face is apathy. I tend to disagree with that, in my opinion. It's really um, lack of exposure. Um, and for students to, students really need to stand up and, and, and show that they are a voice for Israel and a voice for peace. Um, you know, st students have already assumed leadership positions and have dedicated their time and their money um, <coughs> to, because they identify with Israel in some way, but it's, and the truth is, it's, it's not only a Jewish issue, and we see that from um, partnering organizations on campus. You know, we've had the support of college Democrats and college Republicans on campus, and we have organizations like Christians United for Israel on campus, and it's really a broader thing. Um, but I think it's important to point out that what is something that's really concerning is that we have the potential to have every Jewish student on campus um, learn about Israel, um, and later make their opinions and, 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 you know, identify with Israel in some way and become involved. Um, but it's extremely concerning that we only have about 1% of students on this campus, 1% um, of Jewish students on campus, that are actually involved. So um, another challenge we have is professor bias. Um, this is, like, really one of the main challenges of, of students um, is and for students within the pro-Israel student organizations, um, you know, you, you have a class and <clears throat> your professor leaves the entire classroom with a negative impression of Israel that really only reinforces the, the images that are on the mainstream media. Um, and, you know, Israel's not a perfect country, but the double standards that exist within the classroom alone um, are a problem in many institutions. Um, and we face that at FIU. Um, and I'd, I'd like to end with basically increasing, what we need to do is increase understanding and knowledge on the issue and communication within, you know, students within, uh, between the students and the community members and between students and other students. Um, events like these are so important because they, op uh, they open the opportunity for dialogue and they open the doors to education. So, you know, I'd like to end with this. Students are 
the ones on the front lines um, that are facing this delegitimization of Israel. And it's, it's up to us to stand up for Israel on campus and lead positive discussions on Israel. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm really happy that uh, not only that you've got a national view, but also a specific view of FIU, and of course that it came from the students. And I'm so glad to see so many students here, in addition to community members, I'm so glad to see so many students that they can hear this firsthand from another student. Uh, I, at this time, what I would like to do is I would like to call all of our panelists up to the table. We have there an extra chair in the middle. You don't have to take that one now. And somehow we'll try to fit Rebecca in there. Uh, at the end, if we have time for Q&A, but Rebecca will be standing here, so please... Come to the front, uh, if you can, or, or, and have a seat, and then I'll introduce you as well. Thank you. Anywhere? Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we are very blessed to be uh, joined by a panel of really four experts. And I guess we need to turn this projector off, right? All right. Um, Uh, let me start off with actually introducing Carol Brickturn, uh, who is kind of in the middle, uh, if you will. Uh, in 2008, uh, Carol started a new chapter in her life as the Greater Miami Jewish Federation's Jewish Community Relations Council Director, having moved to Miami along with her husband from Fairfax, Virginia. Carol originally moved to Washington, D.C. from New York to join the U.S. Department of Agriculture, where she worked on public policy issues for more than a decade. A graduate of Cornell University with a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Economics, she was recruited to join the Foreign Agricultural Service and served as diplomat in Brussels, Belgium. Carol eventually moved to the private sector and founded her own policy analysis and consulting firm. During this time, she worked and gave speeches in more than 15 countries throughout the Americas, Europe, and Africa. Let me move on to her right, Brian Siegel. Brian Siegel serves as a director of AJC's Miami and Broward office. In his capacity, he's responsible for developing ties with international leaders, as well as ethnic and religious government officials and other community leaders representing the Miami chapter in voluntary and governmental agencies, coalitions and organizations, and responding to relevant community events and crises with approaches and techniques that will lessen intergroup tensions. Brian previously served as the AJC's Assistant Director of Intergroup Affairs and as the coordinator of AJC's Hurricane Katrina Relief Fund. He worked as an associate at two international law firms and also lived in London, working in the British legal system as a Pegasus Trust Fellow through the American Inns of Court Foundation. He has also lived in Israel from 2001 to 2002 as a Dorot Fellow, where he worked as the Israel Democracy Institute and clerked for Chief Justice Aaron Barak at the Israeli Supreme Court. Let me also introduce William Daroff, who comes to us from Washington, D.C. So thank you for being here with us, by the way. Uh, William Daroff was named by the Forward newspaper as being among the 50 most influential Jews in America. As the Vice President for Public Policy and Director of the Washington Office of the Jewish Federations of North America, or JFNA for short, he is a leading advocate for the American Jewish community's agenda in the nation's capital. As a chief lobbyist and principal spokesperson on public policy and international affairs for the 157, 157 Jewish Federations and 400 independent communities represented by JFNA, Daroff ensures that the voice of Jewish federations is a prominent force on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch. In addition to his focus on domestic policies such as health and human services, strengthening the not-for-profit sector and homeland security, Daroff is a key player in foreign policy circles, advising policymakers and elected officials on Jewish communal concerns, principally those related to the U.S.-Israel relationship, the Middle East conflict, vulnerable Jewish communities across the world, and a fight to combat states that promote terror. He is also a leader in the worldwide fight to combat the assault on Israel's legitimacy, acting as a, a key steward of the Federation's movement's $6 million Israel Action Network initiative, and serving on both the steering committee of the Prime Minister of Israel's Global Task Force and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Organizations Working Group. I've already had the pleasure of introducing Robert Tannen, 
uh, I, uh, who then also introduced uh, Rebecca uh, Sterling. And what we're going to do with the following, uh, we're going to do is it follows. Uh, Rebecca is actually going to come up to the podium, and she is actually going to moderate the question and answer. She has a number of questions to our panelists. I will, of course, keep very sharp eye on the clock, uh, looking at about two minutes per answer, uh, but because time is running short, see if you can do it in, in, in a little bit uh, less time. And uh, so I call to the, to, to, to the podium, uh, Rebecca Sterling, again. Thank you very much, Lenny. Um, and thank you all for being here to answer these questions. I've collected a few questions from students um, beforehand that really wanted to get your answers and your opinions on how to deal with certain situations that we're facing. Um, the first one is... Hold on, before you start, you must be parched. Oh, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Rebecca, do you mind moving closer to the microphone so people can hear you a bit better? Okay, no problem. Thank you so much. Okay, the first question is, how can we help students feel comfortable with stepping up for leadership positions when there's a lot of pressure to step up for the job, but not necessarily an establishment or a center to help students feel like somebody has their back? This, in terms of like FIU, um, we're talking about le like leadership <coughs> positions within the pro-Israel movement. Um, and what we're facing is, for example, we don't have a, a center like a, like a Hillel or something like that on our campus. So that's definitely a concern for students. Should we go down? I'll start there. Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Shlomi and the Middle East Society for putting this on. And um, I want to also, in particular, compliment you and, and the Shalom FIU students because I think it shows really strong moral courage to stand up, associate yourself with, and speak out on behalf of Israel, especially when, as you pointed out, many students can easily disassoci disassociate themselves. So, and I think you pointed out the first piece to your question, which is that people need to feel, especially within the Jewish community, a connection to Israel. And... You know, you talked or I, earlier. It was mentioned by Robert uh, Birthright Israel. Um, there's other, you know, opportunities to go to Israel, and I think we need to to promote that so that people feel this connection and and um, are willing to at least uh, learn about Israel. In terms of leadership positions, when there's not a, um, really a, a centralized um, Jewish uh, you know, institution on campus, you know. I think you pointed out really well that you, in uh, putting on Israel Peace Week, um, sought out the help of other community organizations. And you know, I think it's also important to point out that there are specific Jewish organizations that are focused on students on campus. So there's the David Project. There's um, you know several other group organizations that exist to help students on campus to formulate a strategy on how to counter um, some of the, the anti-Israel things. So um, I think giving people first that sense of connection and then two, um, the, the, you know, giving them a sense that there is an overall strategy and there are resources out there. Thank you. Great. So I'll end my thanks to Shomi and Rebecca, but I'll answer your question. Uh, we have your back. How many students are in the room? Okay, and we at Federation and the JCRC have all of your backs. Does anybody know what the JCRC is? Honestly, raise your hand if you know what the JCRC is. Okay, so okay, you work for the JCRC. Mika, you interned at the JCRC. Stanley, you're on the JCRC. Yeah, yeah. The JCRC is the Jewish Community Relations Council, and it is the advocacy arm of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. It is our job to educate and to engage and to activate our, uh, our community including the student body on all campuses in Miami-Dade County, on issues that range from hunger and poverty to Iran, and at the top of our priority list is Israel. Education about and advocacy <coughs> on the state of Israel and its citizens. So we have your back. We are there to help you. We, um, and I'm going to give this to you more than once tonight. We are at JewishMiami.org. 
That's jewishmiami.org. We can be reached directly by email at communityrelations at gmjf.org, communityrelations at gmjf.org, and we are there to work with you, with all of you, any of you students and non-students, um, for this very purpose. Um, I will tell you that you mentioned that there is uh, no Hillel on campus at the moment. Um, our JCRC is fortunate in that sitting on our committee, not only do we have esteemed community members, but we have the AJC, we have the ADL, we have a number of community organizations sitting on our JCRC, and so that we can work in coalition with all of these organizations, and that includes student bodies. And I can tell you that one of our partners is the um, Michael and Russell uh, Jewish Community Center in the north, the Mar JCC. Uh, they sit on our JCRC. There is a community shaliach there who works with students. His name is Dror Gershoni. And I can also tell you, I'm sure that you'll be pleased to hear, is that we are in the process of, or the, the, the Federation Hillel is in the process of making a new hire. Somebody will be hired to work specifically with the student population and FIU, who will be housed at the Mar JCC. And so that he or she, that uh, professional will also have to that. I'll end there, but I will tell you that uh, I have a list of um, communities that is related advocacy um, organizations with local representation with their websites. There are plenty outside. There are plenty for you to take, and all of these organizations also have your back. Lori Yearman is in the room. Lori put this list together. She worked with the JCRC, and Mika Cohn, who is an FIU student, um, is an intern at the JCRC. So if you have any questions about any of this, you can also ask Lori and Mika. I may uh, add my thanks uh, to Rebecca and Shlomi, and, and actually to all of you for being uh, here and taking this time out of your uh, busy evening to learn more about Israel, to stand up for Israel, to be engaged uh, on behalf of the State of Israel. Um, I'll answer the question relatively quickly by saying that, um, as Brian and Carol have said, um, there are a myriad of opportunities, myriad of organizations that are out there through which you can be engaged. Uh, you actually have a... Um, without having a Hillel here on campus, without having an established center, it might actually give you flexibility to be a little bit more creative, to uh, shape uh, the culture of the Jewish uh, student body here, to shape uh, how, to, how to move things forward. It's distinct from being on a campus where there are you know, thousands who are engaged. Um, each, and each of you individually has the ability to, to really take a leadership position uh, earlier than perhaps you would on a larger campus, uh, and to be more creative uh, in that way. Um, I think that the resources that Carol mentioned, the organizations that you mentioned, the organizations Brian mentioned, give you the facts and figures and the knowledge uh, that are necessary to be able to carry this battle forward uh, in order to know uh, how to respond to many of the lies that we saw in Robert's uh, video uh, during his presentation. Uh, lastly, I'll say that um, just about every uh, keen uh, political mind I know in Washington who's involved in the Jewish community, uh, in the pro-Israel community, um, started off uh, having their first leadership experiences uh, in college uh, as Jewish communal leaders, as pro-Israel leaders. Uh, and so uh, clearly this is a, a place where uh, your own leadership skills can be, um, can be refined and you can start and, uh, and look at this as really the beginning of a long process of being engaged to try to make for a stronger U.S. as a relationship and for a stronger uh, American Jewish community. Last but not least, you've already heard from me uh, a lot, so uh, I'll be even more brief than, um, than everyone so far. Um, I think if you take away one thing from tonight, from what I said, from what uh, we're going to discuss now, from the questions you asked later, is that all the organizations you see right here in front of you are here for you, the students. Um, we all have our own niches, our own different things that we specialize in, but the bottom line is we're all pro-Israel organizations, and we all care very much for pro-Israel advocacy on this campus and other campuses throughout the state of Florida. And Carol's right, uh, the JCRC in Miami is the central Jewish address for pro-Israel advocacy in the city of Miami. And she's also accurate in saying that all the organizations that she mentioned all sit together so we can kind of discuss all at once on one voice. And we would, of course, I'm sure, um, you know, urge the students from, from here to come maybe sit in on one of those meetings to kind of learn from us and, and talk to us about the issues that you're having. Um, from the Anti-Defamation League, something that we can offer very specifically to this campus, and we've done this um, in Florida, and my colleague Yel uh, Hirschfield here is, is sitting in the room, big wave, big wave. Mm -hmm. she, was, um, she was behind uh, helping me push the PowerPoint, but the reality is she's, she does a lot more than that, I can promise you. Um, 
she is the one who will be coming out to this campus for, um, potentially and putting on seminars for pro-Israel students on how to support the state of Israel. It's very easy for me to stand up uh, at the podium and address the situation going on and say, do something about it. But we actually come to the campuses in private settings and give you scenarios about what you might see on campus and, uh, and, and, and tell you and teach you how to best respond to those incidents. So with that, we'll uh, move to the next. Thank you very much. So uh, for the students in the room um, who are here, what you guys can gather from this is that all these resources are literally a phone call or an email away, um, and we can bring a lot more uh, pro Israel education on our campus and, and help other students who are uninvolved um, learn of ways to become more involved. Uh, the second question I'd like to ask, um, it deals with uh, students facing bias from their professors, um, either not giving uh, balanced information within their classes. Um, I know a number of students who have faced this at FIU um, and have felt either intimidated or afraid of how to um, how to address this issue or or just they just didn't know what to do whatsoever. So um, how can we <coughs> help like create a more uh, balanced educational and academic environment at FIU? It's a great question, uh, something that is important to obviously to ADL and I think all the organizations up here. Um, I would say, just from ADL's perspective, you know, you heard in, in the introduction of my bio, for those that were listening, I never do, but if you listen, um, one of the things that I do at the agency is I handle complaints from the community on all sides of the spectrum, whatever the complaint may be. Some of them are complaints about professors on campus regarding their bias um, against the state of Israel. What do they do and, and how do we handle it? Well, the ADL does take every complaint that comes to our office very seriously. It's a big part of our job. I would say it's the bread and butter of our agency. It's sort of what keeps us going, and, and um, it, it's, in my opinion, some of our mo most relevant work. Um, the, the answer is not a simple one, but the bottom line is each case and each situation is different. Um, it, it would be impossible for me to generalize and say, in every case you should do this, and in every case you should do this. What we would urge, and some students have stepped forward and come to our agency, um, is to contact us, to call us. Again, something that Yale deals with as well, and, and me also. Um, call us, email us, let us know exactly what the issue is, and we will meet with you. We will talk with you. We will work out that specific situation to give you the best answer that you can possibly get based on your specific case. So um, the number one thing I would say, don't dismiss those things. Don't just ignore them and accept them as reality. Understand that you have an agency that's willing to take those cases, <coughs> uh, take them on, to listen to you, and to take action. Thanks. I, I say, first off, it's important to know the procedures uh, here on campus to deal with um, these sorts of issues. There is, uh, I'm sure, a process with the Dean's Office and the President's Office. Uh, this is a state university, uh, so there is a higher authority in Tallahassee. Uh, and literally uh, every uh, state legislator uh, and the governor's office would be engaged here in a way that perhaps they wouldn't be in engaged in a private uh, venue. Of course, these issues need to be balanced with free speech issues, and there are clearly lines uh, between uh, anti-Israel uh, agitation uh, and discrimination against students uh, and a professor just expressing um, their view, even if it's a wrong view. Um, I'd say that uh, just as a, as a piece of advice, um, now, I, when I was in uh, college the first time around, I used to always sign up for one extra class uh, that I would drop before the, uh, during the uh, drop period. Uh, and I would drop uh, a class if, uh, if there was a particular professor uh, that I thought I wasn't going to get along with uh, ideologically, um, or if there were too many papers. Uh, so uh, you can balance that uh, and, and think ahead about this. Uh, but there are, there are resources here on campus. Uh, this organization is one that could really uh, take the lead in ensuring that, uh, that there is fairness uh, in, in campus. And you shouldn't feel as though uh, you need to either lie in a paper uh, to get an A uh, or to sit through a, a class and get a D just because you uh, disagree with the professor. So I would add just a couple of uh, basic points. Uh, one is to be knowledgeable um, so that when you feel that there is a bias, um, you are uh, fundamentally correct in, in your um, understanding of where the biases lie. 
The second thing is um, I took, I asked Mika if um, she would respond to some of the mm, questions that we were thinking might be raised, and um, this, this question in particular. And I thought that um, her response, just to paraphrase, uh, was really very insightful, because this is coming from a fellow student. Um, and Mika said, don't be afraid of the professor, and don't wait until the class is over. And she went on to say that um, knowing that you have the resources and that you have the friends in the community, we hope, will go a long way towards making your voice heard. So I would only add um, that it's important to have a relationship with uh, university administration. And um, I think in particular here, you, you probably have a very receptive um, audience. But I think there needs to be a sense that anti-Israel rhetoric or propaganda should be taken you know, with the same seriousness as any other forms of bigotry that are, that are not tolerated. Now again, uh, as William pointed out, there are issues of, um, of free speech, and, and, but I think that's why you, you know, it's not an accusation of anti-Jewish you know, anti bias necessarily. It is that they're not satisfactorily teaching their subject. I mean, even if you look at the Middle East society and how they frame the, the conversations that they have, it says all lectures and events strive to present a balanced view on a variety of issues. And I think as a student approaching a professor and saying, you know, along the lines of what Carol was saying, you know, that I want to learn, I want to have a balanced perspective, and you're entitled to your opinion, but I think facts need to come out. So those two things, being willing and, and being factually knowledgeable, but also having that relationship with administrators where you can go and voice your concerns um, in, a, in a productive way. Let me just add, don't wait till after the final, uh, when you've got your D minus, uh, to wave a banner. Talk to the department chair ahead, talk to the dean's office. Make sure that it doesn't look like you just have sour grapes because you didn't study. Thank you very much. Very good. <laughs> We have two more questions for you. Uh, do we have time for that? Yes, you, okay. you're great. Um, <laughs> Time-wise. How do we best deal and something. counter anti-Israel campaigns on campus? How can we learn from other pro-Israel groups, um, pro-Israel organizations across the country and across continents in terms of what they have done on this front? Uh, what is the best and most efficient way for us to reach out to local, uh, regional, and national organizations so we can attain their assistance and their skills? So, sure. sure, so do what you do best. Use social media. Um, see what's happening online. Again, I will tell you that uh, JewishMiami.org, if you go to our website, we actually have um, an advocacy um, toolkit. We presented these at a summit, first presented these at a summit that many of you attended and which ADL and APAP facilitated for high school and college students respectively, we put this together. We have many of these outside. And if you want to learn what we've done, you can take one of these advocacy toolkits, and it has in it uh, many resources for you in moving forward. And so that's one thing that you can do. The same toolkit is online on JewishMiami.org, Take Action, Advocate. And that is regularly updated. And so that's one way of seeing what at least one organization and our partners are doing. There is also a Facebook group. There is a blog, and if you continually look at that particular um, website, you'll see these kinds of updates. In there, by the way, um, are responses to misinformation about Israel. Now, we know that when you hear something and you want to respond, it's very often difficult to give an off-the-cuff response or something that is short and to the point. So we have those responses for you, and this is the kind of thing that could be put on Facebook. I'm not sure that you can read something like this, but I'm sure that you can figure out how to make it into 124 characters or so. 140 characters? But in any case, we don't have this in um, tweet-friendly style, but certainly Facebook-friendly style. Um, and when you see um, things like this, when you see things on Facebook that you want to counter, um, you can certainly do that. And I think the more that you are involved in those social media on this particular subject, the more you'll connect with others um, who can provide resources and information for you. Let me, go ahead. Uh, let me, um, uh, let me add uh, two pieces here. One is, uh, that I think Carol's hit on, um, 
very appropriately, and that is social media. Uh, when, uh, when I was growing up, there was no means to really get instant access to just about every piece of information that's out there, uh, which we now have on the web. Uh, but social media is a, as a, a way that literally you no longer have to rely on the Miami Herald uh, or the New York Times, but there are, uh, there are 100 people in the room. There are 100 of you who literally are reporters. There are thousands of us uh, who are out there with our Blackberries and iPhones uh, who are reporting on the news, who can be uh, a trusted source of information. Each of uh, the four organizations up here are on uh, Twitter, uh, at ADL, at AJC Global, <coughs> at Jewish Miami, uh, and mine is at Daroff, D-A-R-O-F-F, you should follow me. Um, and this is a, a way to get information uh, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get, and to really cut through uh, what's out there to have accurate, timely information. Second thing I'll say is that uh, there is more to Israel, there is more to the U.S. Israel relationship than the conflict, uh, than the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and that's something to focus on as well, as a way to try to move people uh, to see Israel as something more uh, than just an uh, anti-terrorism security barrier uh, or IDF soldiers, heroic IDF soldiers, <coughs> to look at uh, amazing things like this, scientific uh, discoveries and uh, Nobel Prize winners and, uh, and the like that, uh, that really makes Israel the vibrant society that it is. I'll, um, I'll pick up from there, which is to say that I think there's the reactive and I think there's the proactive. And clearly the reactive is having the tools um, that allow us to answer uh, the criticisms and the campaigns against Israel. Uh, but I think no less important is being proactive in the way that William was just describing, because it's not just about debating. It's not just about trying to win the argument. It's also about trying to make friends and being proactive in terms of, you know, through AJC we have Project Interchange where we take university presidents. I took a group a year ago of college student newspaper editors, non-Jewish non -Jewish people, who need to see with their own eyes what Israel is and what it's not. Um, so, and I think there are celebrations that the Israeli consulate, Lindsay Hirsch is here from the consulate, puts on um, that, you know, celebrate, that really celebrate what Israel is and the cultural things that we all, or, or many of us, um, you know, love about Israel, and bringing people to those events uh, so they can see so the other students um, that you want to bring into this. I think so. Again, I think it's being prepared to react when you're called upon, but also being proactive. That's great. I'm glad you mentioned the Project Interchange. It's a great program. Um, ADL is something similar as well. Um, you see, you're getting a theme here that we all have these amazing dynamic programs. Um, we have a, 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 we have many trips to Israel, but one of them that relates to this discussion is a, a campus leaders trip. Um, uh, campus leaders, and we try to bring one from the state of Florida every year, and generally th these are non-Jewish non leaders, if, I, if I'm correct, and obviously the point is to you know bring presidents, vice presidents, editors of the paper, of this campus paper, who have never known much about Israel before, but always been very interested and want to learn more those that can bring back to their schools really what's going on there. Um, because we get to the next question, that's, uh, that's probably something I'm going to touch on as well, is there's nothing to be replaced with going to the State of Israel. Um, for those that have been to the State of Israel, those that have experienced the State of Israel, there's nothing like being there and saying, wow, is this really what it is? Because I had no clue from CNN. I, I really didn't understand. Um, I think the social media thing was great as well. ADL has its own Israel-dedicated page. Um, we have an Israel Facebook page also, um, but I think I'll close this um, this question with um, some kudos, um, some kavod to to you, Rebecca, and to the FIU leaders here, because last year's Israel Peace Week was exactly what we were saying should be done more um, at campuses, not focusing specifically on the conflict, although of course it's going to come up, but focusing on the great things that Israel has to offer. And last year, Rebecca put together an amazing five-day week, which each day promoted a great aspect of Israel. One talked about the green society that Israel is, the environmental technologies that it had to offer. Another day promoted their GLBT awareness. Right? Most people don't discuss these things, that it's a free and open society for gays and lesbians, and, um, and, and, and there was a discussion about that. So. There's so many more ways to do it, but I think um, if you continue to replicate what you did last year, that this campus is on the right track. Thank you. I just wanted to add, because I think we've all touched upon um, the fact that we all work with both Jewish and non-Jewish pro-Israel advocates. I see that Anna Angel is here from Kufi, 
And this past Saturday night, um, we um, at the Federation was one of several supporting groups, along with the Broward Federation and, um, and APAC, um, of a night. It was uh, Jews and Christians United for Israel. It was a summit where we had 2,000 people celebrating um, Israel and um, all that it stands for. The consulate was very involved with that. And um, I would say that um, of the 2,000, probably 1,500 uh, were non-Jews. And so it's important to mention that it's not only among our Jewish friends, it's also with our Christian friends. Thank you. Those are all excellent points, extremely relevant to students on campus today. Um, on that note, I'd like to just make you all aware that we are planning on having an Israel Peace Week um, this current semester at FIU. Um, and you're all invited to, to join us. There will be um, open events for anyone who would like to join, um, tell your tell your friends, uh, tell your children, tell your grandchildren um, to, to become more involved, you know? Just, if they don't know anything about Israel yet, here's a great chance for them to- Rebecca, is there a website or something that you could kind of throw out for people to quickly jot down where they can know when it's yes. gonna happen? There's an, there's an israelpeaceweek.org. Um, and in addition to that, um, for students who specifically want to know more about the FIU events, um, we have an email list. Um, so if you'd like to sign up on that list, we have outside um, a, a place where you can do that. Um, in addition to that, Facebook, um, that's a great way to just spread the word and let people know that you know it's really important for students to stand up and, and, and broaden the perspective on Israel because once you get past that, that, that bias and of only seeing Israel one way, for example, um, Israel is an, uh, it's an apartheid state. Um, once you get past those claims, those those false like myths about Israel, um, then you can have honest conversation about what's really going on, and that's when um, students are able to really engage in dialogue and, and move things forward. So that in the future we don't have to have this, these conversations about conflict. And I'd like to um, uh, pretty much. That's what the next question is. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. How do we successfully reach out to groups like Students for Justice in Palestine? And we want them to understand that we're not anti-Palestinian, that a pro-Israel group can be a pro-Palestinian group. And Shalom FIU, um, we try to let people know that you know we're really, to be pro-Israel doesn't mean you have to be anti-Palestinian. And we want to get that message across because Israel makes efforts for peace, and and that's what we are, um, that's what we are, are representing as students who are pro-Israel. Um, so, what's the best way to get this message across? Okay, um, I'll just give a, a very quick response, and that response is take them to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. It sounds funny, but um, I can tell you that there's nothing like it. Right? There's nothing like going to the state of Israel and seeing for themselves that, wow, this is actually an amazing place. This is a place that treats its citizens very really correct, um, deals with a very, very difficult situation in the best manner that it possibly can, while still trying to protect its own citizens. Um, I'm leading a birthright trip next month, and I can tell you that there's no um, better feeling for me than to know that there's going to be 40 individuals who have never been to the state of Israel before, who know it only through the conflict, and are going to go there and see the state and understand that while this is a great place to be, they have a lot to offer, and, um, and, and I think that would be amazing. Now, is that realistic? Probably not. So what can they do on campus here? Like we said in the last answer, and, and like you did last year, and you're fortunately doing again, I think it's a great thing, Israel Peace Week should be attracting non-Jewish students specifically. We don't need to preach to the choir. I think it's pretty obvious to those that are pro-Israel supporters that know the real facts of the conflict know that Israel, in the end, wants peace. We need to speak to those directly who believe that the opposite is true for whatever reason. They need to come to these events to see, uh, for you know, for themselves to see the the examples that we have to offer um, Israel in a, in a positive light. So um, obviously, you could you would invite uh, who, who you wish, but I think that that non-Jewish students should, should attend. And my colleague Yael would like to jump in. I I just want to add that there are many topics and many groups that would be natural partners with you in discussing issues about Israel. If you were to reach to the Hispanic community, immigration, education is something that may resonate with that group. Well, there's nothing better than to talk about the successful story of incorporating
people from all over the world into Israeli society, the process of assimilation, the process of in integration, and learning from what Israel in that small laboratory has done could be a point of discussion to learning how can we do things here in the United States. So you have natural partners on campus that you can seek to talk about similar experiences. Um, you don't need to go and have a direct confrontation and try to change the minds of those who are already set on bad-mouthing Israel, but seek the ones that don't know about Israel that would like to learn with you and be honest on a dialogue. Those are your natural partners. Let me uh, follow up on Yael's excellent point, which is that um, the way I approach uh, folks is I give them the benefit of the doubt during the first conversation. I assume that they're people of goodwill, uh, that they just you know, are reading too much of the New York Times or, uh, or what have you, uh, and not enough of what they should be reading. Um, that being said, and so I would look for areas of commonality of agreement. I'd look to try to talk to them about a, a mutual desire for two states for two people based on peace, uh, security, and prosperity for all. Um, <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, there are a lot uh, of that cadre, though, who uh, do not believe in two states for two people, uh, who are not coming at this with an open mind, who are um, agitators who are just interested in, in stirring up the pot and in uh, aggravating uh, and agitating. So I think it's important to try to, after you have an open mind, to make that assessment, are these people who really want to talk? Are these people that we really want to try to break bread with? Uh, and if not, uh, leave them alone. Um, there are people who are, uh, Will be uh, will be not in a in a position to be influenced, and we shouldn't waste our time with. I I just echo exactly that. I mean, I think you have to differentiate between the people who are fundamentally will never accept the right of a Jewish state to exist, and and that's you know they're not going to reduce their extreme anti-Israel activity because you're not going to convince them. But I I have to say, I mean, I really like the way you phrase question, which is assuming that we need to be proactive and we need to go out and have conversations and make friends. And I think if you have that attitude and if you do what what the other panelists are suggesting, you're going to find there are some people who, you know, maybe they're unwilling to identify themselves with the Jewish state, but they also might decide not to align themselves with the anti-Israel effort. And that could be a win. You know, that could be considered a win on a given Campus. And then there's others, as Yael mentioned, where there's sort of some natural lines of, um, of sort of uh, agreement where we can work together and build a, a true coalition. So differentiating that and, and um, putting yourself out there and being willing to at least have that initial conversation, I think, is key. I would add briefly that there also are successful programs that bring Palestinian and Israeli students together. Um, there is a Just Vision, there is Through, um, Through Others' Eyes, um, which is a series of photographs where Israelis and Palestinians took each other's photographs in their homes and are able to share them one-on-one -on -one as individuals, relating as individuals and not as Israelis and Palestinians per se. You talk about reaching out to groups and it starts with reaching out to individuals within those groups and I think there are some, um, some models that you can start um, by following. And the second point that I would mention is that our JCRC um, has contracted with Jerusalem Online University, JOU <coughs> Online University. Um, and we have a series of four DVDs that comprise a mini course <coughs> that start with A State is Born and come all the way through uh, Israel Inside, which is a joint project with PBS. Um, we are glad to make those available to uh, any organization uh, who would like to work with us on this. It is free of charge. Um, we will give you the DVDs. Um, it is on an organizational <coughs> basis, and so the Middle East Society can certainly work with us on this. Uh, we ask nothing of you other than to provide us um, what you're doing with them in terms of the advocacy takeaways and the groups who are participating. And you may want to take one of these 20 to 40 minute uh, DVDs and watch them in small groups. Something as very basic as a state is born or shared values or Israel and the media, you can watch in small groups, you can have discussions, and you can move forward from there. And so if you'd like to follow up on us with that, we'd be glad to do that. Thank you very much. Um, 
Um, that wraps up the questions uh, from students at, at FIU that I had already talked to. Um, and now it's for me to talk to them. Well, we're at the end. Uh, we're at the 8.30 mark. So um, I don't know if I should even open the, the floor up for questions. Maybe one question. Is that okay with all of you if we sure. open up for questions? Good luck going, going for only one. <laughs> right. Uh, good luck. Uh, all right. Maybe we'll have two then. Uh, Rebecca, please, if you don't, if you don't mind, I, I don't know if it's too uncomfortable there in the middle. We, we, we stuck it in there. Uh, let's take one question right there. Madam, please go ahead. satisfied feeling from tonight to then because I'm on campus and I ordered classes. Now, what would somebody, if we walked outside and somebody had an apartheid sign, what would we articulate? Reading material is not enough. How do you train or prepare a music major, a math major, somebody who's not pre-law, somebody who's not going to make a career out of speaking? How do you prepare a Jewish child where you say, no, we're not apartheid, here's a bagel? No, what do you really <laughs> train the person, because the uh, Arab child or the Muslim, she's wearing something and she's already making a statement. What does the Jewish child who is not uh, ver you know, verbal, how do you prepare that on a really one sentence, two sentence apartheid? What should they do? I really, I'm frustrated that, uh, how to prepare the young people in the university. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, just to reiterate, what ADL can offer, is the CAST training for students. They're generally designed for, for college students. This stands for confronting anti-Semitism, but we have a, a version which is sort of confronting anti-Israel activity, which Yael, as I mentioned, she spoke a little bit today, she's in the corner, raise her hand again. She would come out and work with students here at FIU, whoever would like to join in a private setting, and pose situations just like that in that room to sort of get the dialogue going and discussion going. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll okay. you. Um, these are three-hour trainings. What, what you're asking for is a life learning. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, the incidents can happen every year. You have the flotilla, and then you ask the question, well, wait a second, how do I respond to the right uh, of Israel to defend itself, whether it's an incursion into Gaza or whether it's the flotilla? It's not about the talking point. It's about a desire to be a life learner. And there's the difference. It's not about how do you react to the one-time confrontation, but are you going to become a constant reader about Israel and Israel's positions? Because the issues change from year to year. But it's the desire to be effective. Now, the strategies, that's something that we can work on on a three-hour training with students on campus on how to come up with strategies to be local to FIU. The talking points, they change from year to year. Do you want to say anything, Carol, or should no, I? Well, that's one end of the spectrum. Certainly, it's a lifelong learning that, that, that this kind of knowledge doesn't begin in college. It begins probably in the womb. However, hot topics, things you should know in one or more paragraphs. And if you're looking for the short answer, if you're looking for the response in the hallway, this covers about 15 different topics and might be a start for additional learning <coughs> of how to respond. And I'll be glad to give this to you as we walk out. It's something that you have tangible in your hand, and at least that student in the hallway can come up with a lucid response. And, and I would start with, uh, just to answer the question when we run into this, this person out front, uh, is yeah. Israel is a, 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 a democracy? <coughs> Israel and Israelis want peace. Uh, throughout its history, it has bent over backwards to try to find peace with, with her neighbors, neighbors who uh, literally starting on the first day declared war on her, and most of whom continue to be in a state of, uh, of, of cold war, if not warm war, uh, with her. Uh, and and, and the, the comparison to apartheid really is, is disrespectful. Uh, to the millions of, of black South Africans who, who lived uh, in a terrible regime um, and asked them what they know about apartheid. Nobody under the age of 30 knows anything about apartheid anymore anyway. So it's, it's really just sloganeering. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. uh, as a student on campus and, you know, we've faced these things. Um, oh, thank you. Okay, I don't want to be too loud here. Um, 
as someone who's actually faced this type of situation, um, you know, it's not necessarily the most strategic and the smartest thing to, to as a pro-Israel group, to go out there and, uh, and start a yelling match about, oh, Israel's an apartheid state, Israel's not an apartheid state. What you want is for the student that's walking by to come, <coughs> come to leave with already that knowledge that Israel, well, actually, um, you might be missing the point here. Israel's a democracy um, with equal rights for you know, all of its citizens, regardless of religion or regardless of ethnicity. So um, how are you going to get that message across to students? Well, the way that we do that is by things like Israeli Peace Week, where we're not engaging in a yelling match. We're just, we're just providing this information for students on campus. And if you're, and if for somebody who is already uh, pro-Israel and sees that, well, what you have to realize is on most campuses you do have a, a group that supports Israel. So you should seek out that group. You shouldn't have to walk away and feel like you're alone on campus because those student groups already exist and you know the more solidarity the better. Um, and, uh, and lastly, I've had the benefit to have been exposed to Israel, you know, I went to Israel, um, I spent, a, you know, my first exposure to Israel, I spent a year there and I volunteered, um, but not everybody gets to do that, I was fortunate enough to, think, thanks to my parents, um, but there are things like birthright Israel, where if a student, you know, they're Jewish and they feel maybe threatened on campus, or they identify as pro-Israel, well, there are ways for students to go to Israel and to learn, um, about Israeli society so that later on they can present a case where, you know, well, I think they might, that apartheid claim, uh, it's not really correct and, and they'll know how to answer it for themselves. Hopefully they can articulate. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, let's take one more question because I think we're, we're, we're going to go ahead. And please, if the panelists could stay to answer any other questions, if you can, that'd be great. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for being here. This has been a pleasure and very enlightening. Um, the thing that struck me the most of everything that was said here today, and maybe because I just focused on it when I heard it, is the idea that there could be student representatives who are being intimidated against coming to a meeting where reasonable minds can discuss situations and issues. I'd like to know a little more about what kind of intimidation is being used, and isn't this something that should be referred to local police authorities or even the FBI? Was this is a crime. Was that in reference, was that in reference to, the, to the part where these uh, student government wanted to go to the APAC? Yeah, that's specifically what I was referring okay. to. Um, well, the type of intimidation that was used, I mean, people have rights to express themselves and, and say, well, we disagree with students, you know, uh, our student representatives um, going to this, but the information that they were using was, um, it was factually incorrect. Um, you know, there was... The way that it was presented, um, for example, in the campus newspaper, was that these student leaders were being bought off uh, by this terrorist organization called the APAC, uh, and you know we don't want FIU students to uh, be associated with anything like that. Well, I mean, when you have that in a campus newspaper and you don't have a reference as to what APAC is, students are going to walk.